This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu. On behalf of the Haas Center for Public Service, I welcome you to Reflections on the 2008 Campaign, Implications for the Vitality of Our Democracy. My name is Leslie Hadamia, class of 1990, JD 97, and the chair of the Haas Center's National Advisory Board. The Haas Center is pleased to present today's forum as part of its mission to develop future public service leadership, broadly defined and shaped through the connection between academic study and service to the world. The Haas Center is a vibrant part of student life on campus, with more than 1,400 students engaged in academic service learning through 75 courses annually and close to 4,000 students participating in community service. These students are involved in such programs as the Public Service Scholars Program, tutoring in East Palo Alto, and alternative spring break projects throughout the country. Public service is alive and well among the Stanford student body. If you'd like to learn more about the Haas Center, I welcome you to engage with the staff after the session. They're in the blue and purple shirts, and the Haas Center website uh, URL is on the bookmark you were handed as you walked in. As a side note, we want to extend our apologies for scheduling this on the Jewish holiday and our appreciation to all of you who are able to join us today. Now, I'm very excited about today's topic, which could not be more timely, given that we're less than four weeks away from the presidential election. We have an amazing panel to speak with you, so let's get started. Our moderator will be Julie lithcott Hames, Associate Vice Provost of Undergraduate Education and Dean of Freshmen. In addition to her official role, Julie has been a longtime volunteer for Stanford as a member of the class of 1989, including service on the Stanford Alumni Association Board. Most relevant to today's topic, Julie has been an active volunteer for the Obama campaign, and she served as an Obama delegate from CD Congressional District 14 right here in Palo Alto to the 2008 Democratic National Convention. For the first 40 or 45 minutes, Julie will moderate a conversation between our two faculty panelists, Professors David Brady and Larry Diamond, whose books, by the way, are on display and for sale at the bookstore if you're so moved to learn more about them. And after the initial panel discussion, we'll open up the floor to questions from the audience for about 45 minutes. Again, thank you for coming, and it's my pleasure to turn it over to Julie. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you so much. I want to acknowledge the, the Haas Center. I want to thank the Haas Center greatly for putting this panel together, for deciding that this issue needed to be one of the classes without quizzes during reunion homecoming. A tremendous amount of work has gone into preparing for the panel, so I just want to um, acknowledge them as Leslie already has done. They, they play an extremely foundational role in the lives of undergraduates and increasingly graduate students on this campus. The Haas Center is, I believe, about to celebrate its 25th anniversary. So thanks to the Haas Center for bringing us all together today. I'm here to be the moderator. I must say, when I was first asked, I thought I might, moderating might entail standing between these two gentlemen as they express their particular opinions, but Professor Brady has informed us that he has a knee injury, so I'm confident that they won't be standing and <laughs> taking... <Larry> <laughs> So it'll be a little bit more subdued than it might otherwise be. Um, as Leslie said, I'm a, I'm a member of the class of 89, and usually in my role on campus, when I say I'm a member of the class of 89, I announce that that was the last truly great class at Stanford. <laughs> and I do that to try to get the students to say exactly what you just did, which is, uh-uh, what? What about my class? Um, and I can't resist when I'm with a group of fellow alumni expressing the pride I have in my class. And of course, it's the pride you have in your class and in being an alum from Stanford that has brought you back to the farm for this wonderful weekend. Here we are 25 days away from a very interesting presidential election. I won't call it historic because I think part of today's conversation will be about whether it is in fact or will turn out to be in, in fact historic. Uh, but it certainly has been interesting and engaging. And here you are back at Stanford having the opportunity at your beloved alma mater to hear from two national experts in democracy and politics and elections about their thoughts about this process, what it's been like, what's going to happen, and what it means for this country. Before I turn things over to them, get things started with a question, I do want to say that um, as a delegate, as an elected delegate from right here in Stanford, Palo Alto, East Palo Alto, and surrounding areas, um, I did have a chance to go to this glorious Democratic National Convention. 
And um, I'm a regular old person. I'm up here. I'm not an expert. I'm just a volunteer who got involved. And it has been um, an exhilarating experience for me. Uh, but as, as, um, as exciting as it was to be a part of that drama unfolding in Denver, I think what I enjoyed the most about these last 18 months uh, were my, my travels uh, to Texas and Indiana and even going door to door right here in Palo Alto to have conversations with my fellow Americans about policy and candidates. And I, was, um, I had the opportunity to meet people I don't normally meet. I heard a lot of things I didn't like, but I had an opportunity because of hearing those things uh, to strengthen my own opinions and my own beliefs about what mattered. And um, I'll never forget those conversations. Even the most difficult ones were of great value to me. I also have to tell you that I've seen the young people on this campus, in this area of the country, in Texas and Indiana, and of course I've read about it happening elsewhere. These young people have been transformed um, by this election, and the election has been transformed by their presence and involvement in it. And I think as dean of freshmen on this campus, I have um, gotten great joy out of watching our undergraduates put down their iPhones and their Blackberries and their Nintendo Wii's and whatever else usually uh, commands much of their attention uh, to instead focus on great issues of importance to our country, to our democracy, and to us as citizens of this country and this world. So, reflections on the 2008 campaign. What are the implications for the future vitality of our democracy? I know there are a lot of great panels happening right now but I think you are in for the greatest treat today. Our panelists are Professor David Brady, who is the Boson H. and Janice Arthur McCoy Professor in Political Science and Leadership Values in Poli Sci and in the Business School. Professor Brady is also a Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution and the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research, known as CEPR, and the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies. He'll joke that he has all of these affiliations because nobody wants him in one place for any particular <laughs> length of time. He's an expert on the US Congress and congressional decision making. So we've just been treated to some great decision making on the part of the Congress, and I'm sure he will <laughs> analyze and write about that, and we'll all read what he thinks. His current research focuses on the political history of the US Congress and the history of US election results and public policy processes in general. Professor Brady won the Ninkelspiel Award for service to undergraduates, the Richard Lyman Prize for service to alumni, and the first Phi Beta Kappa Teaching Award given at Stanford. Please join me in welcoming Professor David Brady. And to my left is Professor Larry Diamond, who has a degree here, an undergraduate degree from 1973, a master's in 78, and a PhD in 1980. Professor Diamond is a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution and by courtesy at the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies and professor by courtesy of sociology and political science, someone who also has a number of affiliations across our great campus. Professor Diamond writes and consults on US efforts to promote democracy abroad and on international development policies and programs. In early 2004, he was a senior advisor to the US Occupation Authority in Iraq on political transition issues. Boy, are we lucky to have these two here today. Last year, Professor Diamond won that same Dinkelspiel Award for exceptional service to undergraduate education. He serves on the faculty steering committee of the Haas Center, our host organization here today. And I will add, he's also a member of the Obama campaign's foreign policy advisory team. But I do want to emphasize that he is speaking today in his independent capacity and not on behalf of or as a part of the Obama campaign. With that, I'm going to turn to our first question, which is, I think, the question most burning in all of your minds. The election is just over three weeks away. What do you think is about to happen? What do you think of what's happened so far? And who is going to win? <laughs> and uh, I think normally uh, they do a coin toss right. to decide who gets to go first. Right, we didn't start. do the coin toss. You uh, want to start? Go ahead. We're going to have Professor Diamond go first. Uh, well. <laughs> I, I think it's now very likely that Obama is going to be elected president. Um, and we all know the reason why it's moved from being somewhat likely to very likely, and that is the economic catastrophe that has fallen upon the country in the last few weeks. Uh, I think this could produce uh, an election 
that is decided um, by a decisive margin, well over 300 electoral votes, and um, much more of a mandate to do something uh, when the new president comes in on uh, January 20th of next year. I also think it may lead to more uh, uh, swings in the congressional representation uh, and a more, even more decisive Democratic majority in the Congress than would otherwise have been the case because, well, Dave is the expert here, so I'll let him speak to it. The Democrats were likely to gain anyway. Now they may gain more. But I'd like to say two final things. Number one, you said there's still 25 days. Uh, I do worry a little bit, um, you know, as an Obama partisan about overconfidence, frankly. One of the things that put Obama in this position is the enormous passion that people had. You were a part of it, you saw it, you experienced it, you contributed to it. And one of the reasons why I was hopeful, frankly, when it was a tight race that he was gonna win, we'll talk about this more as we get through your other questions, is that there's such an incredible organization to this campaign, which I think is gonna be seen on election day in terms of uh, voter turnout. Um, but it's important that they not get <clears throat> overconfident uh, and uh, something else could happen. I mean, we didn't anticipate that this was gonna happen. There's still 25 days left. Okay, thanks, Larry. David. Uh, the way I think about elections uh, is sort of different from what you might, the chattering class might, might think about. So as Howard Wolf, who's back there somewhere, can testify, I've been saying for about 14 months that I thought Senator Obama would be elected, whoever the Democratic nominee who I thought would be Senator Obama would win. And the way uh, we essentially start is, what's the baseline? I mean, you know, how do you think about elections so that you're not thinking about this particular election or a poll, which is just a chart? So uh, essentially, uh, political economists view this uh, election as a uh, function. Uh, elections are retrospective events by voters. Voters go in and they, uh, when they vote, they vote on how well the president, the incumbent president's party has done over the past four years. And there are two dimensions to that. The first dimension is the economic dimension. And we have really pretty good data back to 1876 that tells us uh, how well the economy is doing. And uh, so the best, the leading model that just uses the economics is called the FAIR model, not particularly because it's FAIR, but because the guy who invented it is a guy named Ray FAIR at, uh, <laughs> at uh, Yale, but it's appropriate. So um, that model on the economics alone tells you that the Democratic candidate should win with about 53% of the vote. Uh, that's, the, that's the butter part of the model. And the second part of the model is uh, guns. And uh, when presidents are at war, uh, particularly in the post-World War II period, uh, the opposition to the war hurts the incumbent president's party. Now this war, and, and usually opposition is a direct function, it's a log linear function of uh, deaths. This war uh, is unpopular, but the effect is not likely to be so great because the number of deaths is not so high and there's no draft. So uh, the model tells me, the, uh, my particular variant of the guns and butter model, tells me that the Democrat should be 54 to 46, 55, 45, uh, given the state of the economy. So then what matters is the campaign. And I actually thought until, until right after the convention, the McCain campaign had done an amazing job because, on, on my view, Obama, Senator Obama should have been ahead by uh, six, eight points, and he wasn't. Uh, in fact, on a series of character issues, Senator McCain was ahead, and on economic issues, before the crisis started, the latest Gallup poll had 47% uh, thought Obama would manage the economy better, 42% thought McCain. So uh, what happens when this crisis hits it's uh, it, it, it all it reversed uh, the campaign and it forces the issue on uh, not now about 70 percent of the people say that the economy is the major issue and if you think the econ all all along if you thought the economy was the important issue you're more likely to vote for Obama if you thought terrorism was more important you're more likely to vote for um, McCain so as terrorism goes down and the economy goes up it boosts uh, it boosts uh, it, it boosts Obama and the result is in the electoral college. Uh, there are, uh, as I calculated just before I came over, Obama has 204 electoral college votes that are, are absolute rock solid. Uh, there's 168, there are 14 states where the candidates are campaigning, i.e. ads, anything, only 14, 168 votes. And in those, 113 of them, Senator Obama leads. 
leading in Florida, Ohio, there are very few states that, and there's not a single state where McCain, single of those 14 states where McCain's leading. Now, what could happen in the 25 days? I don't, I don't see much. Uh, so I'm like 80, 20, I mean, I don't know. Somebody asked me on uh, National Public Radio the other day what I thought, I, they cut the answer, but, uh, <laughs> well, my answer was, you know, they wanted to talk about would Bush start another war or something, some silly stuff. So I thought, well, maybe if in the next debate, Obama unrobed and ran around naked, that, that might, but I, I just can't think of anything. I think it's 80-20 uh, that he'll win and probably higher. I actually, I don't see them making a mistake. They're, they're well organized. I agree with Larry. I had it at about 245, 190 in the House, 10 seat gain or so for the Democrats. I had the Senate at 56, 44. Uh, and to be honest now, I know Larry's right. Those numbers have gone up big and I haven't, uh, I'm trying to work through the calculations on what I think they'll be, but they're a hell of a lot bigger than what I thought they were uh, before the crisis. So uh, I, I think this election's pretty much over. Uh, uh, Senator Obama will be the next president of the United States, unless some era that I can't, I, I just can't even, I can't think of anything that would change those, uh, that pattern. It's just, it's there. Okay. Do you have a follow-up at all, Larry? No, let's move on okay. so we can involve well, the audience. Well, because we're not here to discuss who's going to win, uh, but we wanted to get that out um, at, right at the outset because it's on all of our minds, I think. Um, so we, we have some predictions up here, but what we're here to really talk about is the implications for the future vitality of our beloved democracy. So the question I want to turn to now is, um, as a result of this presidential campaign cycle we've been through, um, what effect is the digital age? seeming to have um, uh, on American politics. As voters are mobilized and receive their political news by different means and in different proportions, how is that gonna affect uh, democracy in the United States? Well, you know, I'll start with the obvious. I think it's obvious. I'll make the assertion anyway. Uh, Barack Obama would not have been the Democratic nominee without the internet. Um, the internet uh, enabled him to raise uh, massive amounts of money in small amounts uh, that he would not have been able to raise nearly as easily. Uh, it uh, most of all created a deep infrastructure. Again, you saw it, and I know you're involved in the internet. You're a very popular Facebooker uh, among students here on campus and so on. So you appreciate this, Julie. Um, what is different in 2008 from 2004 is that people who were participating in the election campaign were not merely passive recipients uh, and were not merely being organized from the top down by the internet. They were taking the initiative and organizing from the bottom up. I mean, giving money is, is one way that they were doing it. Not being asked to give money by an email, that came later, but taking the initiative to go on the website and give money, taking the initiative to find out where an event may be occurring, and using Facebook or other social networking devices to actually uh, organize new pods of activity and enthusiasm for Obama. MyBarackObama.com uh, uh, networking site has over a million people now that are signed up to it. I mean, there's, no, there's just no precedent for this in American politics. When you look at how close the race was between Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama, and um, uh, you know, how much of a difference this made in terms of his organization, his ability to win close caucus states uh, uh, by using this means of organization, and his ab ability to raise massive amounts of money in small amounts very quickly, he would not have been the nominee without the internet. Now I'd like to say uh, one other thing uh, for now uh, in answer to the question you, and I believe this will carry over to the future in terms of participation, and I think this is absolutely gonna transform for the future the way American politicians campaign and the possibility that other candidates at various levels from city council to senate and governor to president could emerge from a lower profile and mobilize in this way to become more competitive without the natural beginning visibility or uh, advantages. There is one thing um, in particular, however, that I think represents a somewhat more disturbing side of this, and it's about how people get their information. 
I have found, as I kind of navigate around the internet and look at political sites, uh, that most of the sites uh, that people are really enthusiastic about and are participating in are very partisan and very ideological. And I think we're in a bit of an echo chamber here that is really worrying me. I, I think this is true with some of what's going on in television as well, mm -hmm. and we could talk about that. But um, the sites that are people are blogging on to are tending to attract um, very, very partisan and ideologically committed people. And they're in some ways tending, I think, to further polarize politics in this country. And that, I think, is not a healthy thing. And we'll get to polarization as our, uh, as our next question. Thank you very much, Larry. David, um, back to you on digital age. Well, um, I hadn't thought about uh, Larry's first point, and I think he's absolutely right on that. Uh, how, I only ask question, how many of you uh, are in Facebook. Damn few, okay. Uh, you better get with it. Yeah, so <laughs> are you, you're on? Okay, so I'm not, I have no intention of being in Facebook now or ever. Uh, but the interesting thing about that is this turns out to be a huge, uh, huge political deal. As Larry points out on Facebook, there are, uh, Obama has now over 1,600,000 friends of Obama on Facebook. and. Uh, and uh, Senator McCain, I think, has like 106,000 or something. And uh, there's some, that's where you learn there's something called a nudge, which I had no idea was. But a nudge means like on the Facebook, you can whack your friends poke. like with your it's elbow, poke. 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 poke, okay, sorry. Like Technically, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and it turns out that that's registered about 250,000 voters, most of them under 30. Uh, as you saw by the response. So, so that, it has had an effect. I hadn't thought about the first point that Larry made, but I think that's exactly right. So I worry a little bit about a, a different thing. I think he's absolutely right about the blogs. There's a terrific sort, uh, source called uh, um, journal, uh, journalism, uh, journalism Center for Responsible Journalism called journalism.org. And every year they do a report on the state of the media, blogs, TV news. It's really a great uh, review. I suggest you just do the executive summary. I forgot that and printed out 462 pages. Um, <laughs> that's why I'm not in. That's why I'm not in Facebook. Yes. Okay. So, uh, so on, in this regard, the blog. Larry's exactly right. On the blogs, they've gotten very popular, but bloggers don't talk to each other. There's lefty bloggers and there's righty bloggers. And the interesting thing is there's no moderate bloggers. Uh, moderates sort of go, well, not worth it. Uh, hard, hard to be intensely moderate. Um, well, I mean, seriously, there's, so you get, so, well, seriously, so That's you get people problem. who really care on the left and the right. They talk to each other, yeah. mm -hmm. and they don't, they don't, they talk to, to each other. They don't talk to uh, each other in the sense of liberals and conservatives. Liberals talk to liberals and conservatives to conservatives. Uh, so I agree with that. The, so the only other thing I had to add to feed off of his point on TV, and I do worry a little bit, uh, so and I don't know whether which direction uh, I worry, it should go further or stay the same, but it used to be that uh, if you wanted to find out who won a debate, you didn't have to wait for two or three days to get the polls. What you did is you got the bipper, and as you know, males are great at that. You just boom, 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 hop, CNN, ABC, CBS. You, you hop to the six channels. You heard what they said. You had to wait. You had to wait till next morning when the New York Times and, uh, and the Wall Street Journal, and, the, and there was a consensus. And, and it moved that way. I think the, that consensus is now gone. Uh, there are so many different places where people can get news and information. It turns out, true fact, there are more people on YouTube that watch the Tina Fey, uh, K K Katie Couric non-interview <laughs> than watch oh, yeah. the actual interview. <laughs> so that, that phenomenon means there are so many different sources that people get information that we know, you know, it wasn't like uh, for, it's great having an audience where people actually remember 1960, some of you anyway. Uh, <laughs> You know, when Kennedy was assassinated, there, there are certain events when, the, when, when, under President, when under President Reagan, the spaceship went down. There are events we all remember, and there was one TV channel, and there was a national interpretation of those events. I think that's gone. That's gone as the media uh, moves out and across, and people uh, get information from different sources. And so that is going to have an effect on us. I don't know, uh, and, and I'd like to say, you'd not, your instinct is to say, well, that's bad or not so good. 
But that may not be so because the internet has done so many other interesting things. They may figure out ways to get people talking to each other on the internet. It hadn't happened yet, but that doesn't mean it won't, won't develop that way. So, uh, and the other thing is, there are no longer in politics any private moments. Yes. <laughs> Whatever you do, somebody's got it on YouTube or on, a, uh, or on a, one of those little cell phone picture things. So uh, politics has changed like that. Can't make any mistakes. So you made the point that Obama um, made good use of that newfangled thing we call the internet. But the internet was available to everybody. So what was it about the, the campaign? Why was it that the other campaigns didn't see from perhaps Howard Dean's example um, last time around that the internet was in fact the way to get the grassroots mobilization going? I don't think it's a coincidence that he was the youngest candidate in the, in the race. Um, I think he had more of an instinctive feel for it. And uh, I don't think it's a coincidence that, oh, I'm sorry to use this term, he was a community organizer. Uh, when you merge um, you know, community organizer with the technological era that we live in now, what you get is communi community organizing with its vertical movements both down and up. Um, writ large over the internet. And he had some absolutely, and has some absolutely brilliant people working with him, including one of the founders of Facebook, uh, who had an instinctive feel for this that others did not. Uh, so I think you put all these things together and um, it, it was a home run for them. And it will be, I think, on November 4th. Uh, let's, my view would be let's not overestimate. The, so there, the, if I'm trying to explain the Obama victory, I agree with Larry on, on the right-hand side of the equation. There is something called the internet, but there's a whole lot of other stuff. Uh, for example, had Senator, uh, had Senator Clinton not thought she had it made, and therefore chosen not to work in caucus states. So basically, on Super Tuesday, uh, Senator Clinton won big in the popular uh, vote. But when the day was done, when all the votes were calculated, she actually was down about 10 electoral college votes because Senator Obama had organized on the ground in all those caucus states. The internet was somewhat useful, but the strategy was, was broader than that. The internet's important, it doesn't drive it. And the, part of the answer to that is, by the way, Howard Dean, the reason the others didn't pick up on it was because of Howard Dean. I mean, he raised a little money, but he didn't win. <laughs> And, and people thought, well, it wasn't that important. And, and Senator Obama, Larry correctly points out uh, that Obama picked up on that and his people used it, and it was a huge factor. And I, probably, and I think it's probably right, without it, he wouldn't have won. But, there's, but, the, but the Obama campaign was, was as uh, David Broder uh, said uh, a year and a half ago, said this was the best campaign I've ever seen. And he's been covering it for a long time. So it was the internet, but it was an exceedingly well organized, well thought out campaign. All right, let's turn from the internet to um, the polarization issue you both have mentioned. Um, we all talk about red states and blue states. We talk about liberals versus conservatives. Has this election campaign further polarized American politics or transcended political and ideological boundaries? Why don't you go first? Why don't you go first? Yeah, is that, is that one of the seven books that I have that's on sale that never sold anything? It might be. Uh, oh. <laughs> it just doesn't really... Never I'm not expecting anyone to buy any. I, I, uh, you know, the academics, we have a lot of books, just no sales. Uh, so we did a, uh, we did a, a Hoover Institution did a joint project with the Brookings Institution to talk about polarization. And so you have to make some distinctions. So there's sort of three levels of polarization. One is uh, how do members of the US Congress vote, the, the, elite, uh, the governmental elite, how do they vote? And surely since 1974, there's a lot more partisanship in Congress. So in the old days, you would have seen sort of a normal distribution with some Democrats left of center and some Republicans right of center. So you'd have Southern conservative Democrats and, and uh, liberal uh, Republicans like Rockefeller, et cetera. And uh, so you can't use that in class, by the way. I uh, have no idea who that is. So uh, that's one level. Then, then the elite, the party elites, they're also quite polarized, but they've always been polarized. Back to 1952, we have evidence that if you ask people who went to Democratic and Republican national conventions, there are huge differences between them. But the, the, the real issue is what about the American public? And uh, our colleague, Morris Fiorina, has a book on sort of what culture war where he argues that the uh, American public is still pretty much in the middle 
and uh, on the uh, and it's the elites that, that are polarized. Uh, so uh, the story is, uh, I think at the first two levels there is uh, polarization, and whether that's good or bad, I don't know. I do know that historically, uh, back to 1856, uh, if we look at 1846 actually, if we look at the history of voting in Congress. Uh, there's lots of periods of very high polarization where Democrats and Republicans don't vote alike. We manage to survive uh, most of those things. So I'm not sure, uh, I'm, I have no definitive opinion on whether polarization is good or bad. I think the effects of it are exaggerated. Uh, and so this campaign has been, uh, hasn't been any better or worse. Uh, I know p every campaign people always say, oh, this is the most wor worst ads. I, I, I ask you to go back to the Lincoln-Douglas debates which were brilliant in, in some ways, absolutely brilliant on the issue of slavery and uh, how it was defined. And they had so much time. The opening speaker spoke for 90 minutes, then there was an hour rebuttal. And now nobody's going to listen that much today. But, but my point is, there were allegations of scandal, corruption. You read those debates, they were saying the same things, much nastier than anything McCain or Obama have said about each other. So I don't think this campaign's particularly nasty. Uh, it's nasty, but that's politics. Uh. Larry. Well, it has been a while um, since I've heard uh, someone from the audience uh, yell in response to a condemnation of a presidential candidate by the vice presidential nominee of another party in a sneering and dismissive way, uh, treason. Uh, with this heard by a number of people, and quite possibly the vice presidential candidate who uh, then did nothing about it. I, I think that there are inferences being um, thrown around here, Dave, and um, uh, slurs and uh, manipulation of the obvious um, uh, you know, potential vulnerability of this candidate, namely that he's uh, African American and has a name that has a vague Muslim sound to it, um, that, that are frankly ugly and disturbing and have not been uh, sufficiently rejected uh, by the candidate uh, or either of the candidates, McCain or Palin. I don't hear uh, Obama going around um, at one campaign stop after another, um, you know, uh, in referring to his opponent as John Sidney McCain. Uh, and, huh? The third. Oh, thank you. The third. Uh, that's a very important addition. And so, you know, I, I think that there's something, you know, there, there is an undercurrent here that worries me a little bit. I would like to get back to the point by saying one more thing that I think uh, is potentially hopeful, at least from my standpoint, and that is um, that uh, the scope of the victory by uh, Senator Obama and potentially by Democrats in congressional elections may change that map of red and blue in ways that could you know, uh, have more lasting effects and uh, reconfigure the sort of entrenched uh, geographic polarization that we've seen for a long period of time. Obama now has a chance to win some states that a Democratic presidential candidate has not won in 44 years. And he's certainly competitive uh, in a number of them. And you may have um, Democrats winning, again, you're the expert on this, Dave, you might want to say something about it, some districts that have been Republican for a considerable period of time now. Now, there's another hopeful element in that, and Dave and others who write about congressional elections have written about this. People who are elected from swing districts, Republicans you know, from districts that are more moderate, Democrats from districts that are more conservative than the ones uh, that um, uh, most Democrats represent tend to be uh, more moderate when they go to Congress, more sensitive to the divisions in our political fabric, and a little bit more able to come together across party lines to bridge the divide. Um, that's the positive thing. The negative thing is if you have an overwhelming Democratic majority in both houses of Congress, and they decide to do to the Republicans what the Republicans did to them, which has frankly been their attitude in these two years since gaining control, that's going to deepen polarization again, and I think it's going to be extremely regrettable. Well, it's good. We do have differences. Uh, let me go through them. 
first, Obama's up by 12 points. What, what, what do you expect McCain to do? Look, in, in 1964, there was a commercial that showed uh, uh, a little girl, he will, he won't, in a field, picking the daisies, and then, and then the atomic bomb goes off. Now, was that a good commercial? Yeah, it worked. I mean, in, in the sense that, uh, in, in, so it seems to me whenever you get behind, you got to do what you can do. Johnson was ahead in six. I understand. Made it even worse uh, <laughs> if, if you think about it. But I, I tend to think of politics as a very realistic game in which you look at, here, here's one way to think of it. Think of uh, McDonald's and Burger King. They advertise against each other all the time, don't they? And, and it's not nasty at all. It's quite pleasant. <laughs> Go to Burger King, get a croissant, whatever it is. Now, just change one rule. On November 6th, uh, 2008, whoever sells the most hamburgers that day, they're the only one that gets to sell hamburgers for the next four years. <laughs> How do you suppose the advertising is going to look? There are going to be people walking out of McDonald's dying. There's going to be 800 pounders in Burger King. So I, I tend to think of this, I, I try to think of this in a nonpartisan way. And I, uh, and it doesn't mean I personally approve it, but I, I don't see uh, Senator McCain has to hit at character issues uh, because the economy is not, again, moving in his direction. It's just not an issue he's going to win on. But isn't, so, isn't the American character wounded by um, the behavior that McCain feels, as you've said, he has to resort to at this point with being 12 points behind? And doesn't that matter? What, what, are, the, what are the... So uh, give me an example of uh, what you mean by the American character. I guess what I mean is to Tolerance, see... Tolerance, for example. That's an important piece of the American character. You think that the fact that we're going to elect the first African-American president in history, he's going to win by 12 points in a landslide? What's enough? I, I, I don't know. No, I'm I, saying the way that, that uh, the Republicans have played with this issue at times uh, has tried to stir this issue in a, in a way that I think demeans our character as a country. Uh, and I think there are times that Senator McCain and Governor Palin has, have condoned it, failed to condemn it, didn't condemn it at this rally, and I think that is condemnable. Uh, well, I don't, know how to, I don't know how to think about that. You're, I, I, don't, I guess I, I don't agree. I don't, I, I don't see that much of it. Could be much worse. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not condoning that particular aspect, but I look at the campaign, it could have been a lot worse historically. Uh, no one is so. I mean, if you go back historically, Andrew Jackson, the claim that his wife was a prostitute, uh, it's been much worse. Yeah. Uh, it's been much worse, and the American character hasn't dissipated. Uh, this is a pretty, uh, this is a pretty strong, strong country, and I, I, uh, I take pride rather in the fact that uh, we have an African American candidate who's going to be elected president of the United States. Let's see what he does. So I'm, I'm going to stick to that side, and you can have the other side, I'll take the, my side. All right. I'm mindful of the time. I want to be sure that you guys get an opportunity to ask questions of our wonderful panelists. I do have uh, at least one more question that maybe will come out to the audience. Um, guys, what are the prospects for real change in politics, in policies and practices in Washington, depending on who is elected? <laughs> uh. Well, look, there's campaigning and there's governing. We're campaigning now. And campaigning means um, you, do, you make what promises, you say what you need to do to get elected. So, so you know, and it's, it's true of both sides. Uh, uh, you know, has any, and not, why has no one actually explained the McCain health care program and how it actually works? Why you tax it, why you don't? Uh, Senator Obama says, you know, the national debt has gone up further than any time in our history. Well. That's true, unless you uh, divide by real dollars uh, to, to make apples compared to apples and oranges. It has gone up more than it should have, in my view, but it's nowhere near the all-time high. Even, even with the bailout, it's still only about 5% of GDP, which puts you slightly below. So the debt, government debt, even with the bailout, is only 5% of gross domestic product, which is below the uh, average in the European Union. So. So, but that's, but my understanding of this, fine. That's what you, you, you campaign. You, you don't expect a candidate gets up and starts explaining that, and gets the charts out, 
the American public is switched off and they're watching baseball. They're not paying attention. So, so you got to campaign. But then, then the time comes when you got to govern. So what has changed me? There's three things you can look at. First thing is, after, uh, the, after the candidate wins, who do they appoint to these slots? And Jimmy Carter, for example, Mr. Change, uh, chicken right out in 1976 and appointed every single Washington insider. So you want to watch who uh, Senator Obama, in my view, will appoint. Then the second thing you, you have to look for, what, are they, what does he prioritize? And candidates, here's, here's the campaign governing difference. In, uh, Bill Clinton said in 1992, I'm opposed to NAFTA. We're going to have a commission on the environment and a condition on labor unions. And without it, I won't sign NAFTA. NAFTA got signed exactly as George Bush and a Stanford alum, Carla Hills, did it. We don't have those commissions. He then said, well, we're not letting China uh, have most favored nation status, or let alone in WTO. Who is the president that got China most favored nation status and in the WTO? Bill Clinton. And George Bush in the 2000 debates said to Al Gore, listen, your policy is way too aggressive on this dimension. We don't know much about nation building, so we shouldn't be doing it. And then George Bush spends seven and a half years trying to build a nation and not working. Um, so the bottom line is that's campaigning and governing. So, uh, so stuff happens. You have to prioritize. And my view is with the debt, so, so each candidate has, uh, Senator Obama is going to spend $65 billion on health care reform. He has $100 billion in savings, which in my view are not really there. Some of it, $35 billion is based on uh, electronic uh, stuff. That's not going to happen. So, but I, I don't blame them. That's the way it goes. So the question is, they get in that period, then you got to decide what you're actually going to do and what you prioritize. And that's the tough question because uh, with the Clintons in 92, they were going to change health care, and you remember that didn't happen. So the third part you have to look at is, who's the 218th member of the House of Representatives and who's the 60th senator? Because they're the ones that can veto it. So Larry's absolutely right. The bigger that majority is, the more likely they can do that. Even under those conditions, they're going to be constrained somewhat by the size of the deficit, which may get even, even bigger if you saw what happened to the market again today. So, so the bottom line is, those are the things I look for. It's really hard to change American politics. Uh, but this is the best chance probably since, uh, probably since Reagan or maybe John, we, we could dispute that, but uh, it's certainly the best chance in the last 25 years and maybe the best chance in the last 50 years. Okay, thank you very much. Well, I would say that real change has to be located in, in two dimensions. One dimension is policy. So are we going to get real change in economic and uh, domestic and foreign policy? I would say yes, but with a substantial caveat that um, I entirely agree with uh, David on, and that is you can't always anticipate what the policies are going to be uh, by looking at what they said during the campaign. You know, uh, first of all, the realities of um, the policy trade-offs look very differently when you get in the White House than they do on the campaign trail, and secondly. Surprise, surprise, there's a certain amount of pandering during an election campaign. We'll just leave it at that. Um, I think more relevant, Julie, to, uh, your, you, you, to this panel here is the question of whether there's going to be change in the nature of American politics uh, and in some of the problems that we're talking about. And there, I'd say that's going to depend um, first and foremost on Barack Obama as president, if he's elected, and second of all on the congressional leadership. Let me just say a word about each. I'm much more confident about a President Obama than I am about this congressional leadership. I think Obama's instincts uh, are really, and this is why he appeals to a lot of Republicans and moderates, really are to reach across the traditional divides and bring out the best in us and try and a little bit transcend um, uh, the traditional ideological fissures in American public life. I think he will appoint at least one prominent Republican to his cabinet. It might be as Treasury Secretary. I think he'd do a wonderful thing to bring someone like Mike Bloomberg, even though I realize he's not literally a Republican now, into his cabinet. Uh, and I think he will not want to govern in a way that simply gets rams through a 51% majority. Uh, I think that his instinct 
is to craft a new type of majority on a lot of issues, which is, of course, a, a much shrewder political tactic for the long run uh, if you want to really sustain and reach further um, for transformative policy change. Uh, but there's also the question of a lot of these divisive and extremely difficult issues, not just how we solve the mess of toxic mortgages or the huge uh, debt overhang that we're stuck with, but Medicare and Social Security coming down the road. And there, I don't think there can be a, a partisan solution that's, that's going to work. And I would suggest to the next administration that they do, frankly, what McCain suggested in the last debate. I think people laughed at it or rolled their eyes, but there is a place for a bipartisan commission to look at this outside of the white heat of the internet uh, and the chat rooms and the daily political flow and really think about what's best uh, for the country and come up with a plan uh, that the president will um, get behind and really put the pressure on the Congress to defend uh, changing it in short-sighted ways. One last word about the leaders of Congress. They had an opportunity, and I'm a Democrat, I think that's known. Um, they had an opportunity in January uh, of um, 2007 to begin to break down a little bit of this partisan bitterness uh, and to reach further than they did, though they did take significant steps on ethics reform, lobbying reform, and so on, but they've been very partial. And the instinct is just to take control and repay all of the favors that uh, were visited upon them by the previous majority. That's not the right instinct for improving our politics. And I don't think it's smart politics for them either. Because if they remember what Dave said, uh, a large power um, mobilizing majority in Congress at one moment will invite an electoral reaction down the road. Uh, two quick comments. One, well, maybe not so quick. Uh, after all, I'm a professor. Uh, <laughs> Larry, I, uh, my comments earlier about the dilemma, the, the, uh, about the three parts were all about domestic policy. I think on foreign policy, Larry's quite right. There, there you're likely to see significant changes, and the president is the first mover and doesn't have to deal with this. I, I actually have a much kinder and charitable interpretation of the Democrats in 2007 and Speaker Pelosi. Uh, I, I believe uh, what happens in Congress is uh, le leaders in Congress pass the legislation they can pass by whatever tactics they can pass them by. And that means, so Senator Pelosi comes in and uh, the left and her party uh, want to end the Iraq war, they want to impeach George Bush, they want to do a bunch of this stuff. It's not going to happen. So she's got the left wing in her party, she's got, she's got a bunch of so-called blue dog Democrats who come from states like Nebraska and Montana, and those guys are not liberals. They're not like, San Francisco and Montana aren't the same. That's a strange idea. <laughs> so Senator Chester from Montana ran against Joe, Conrad Burns on the grounds that Burns was soft on gun control. That means Burns thought every Montana only ought to have eight. Uh, guns as opposed to the 13 Tester has. <laughs> so, so my view is that Sen uh, 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 Speaker Pelosi got past what she could pass with the majority she had. And so uh, if policy's going to move uh, in a particular direction, they've got to have a bigger majority is my view. So I, I think they did to the Republicans what the Republicans did to them, what the Democrats had done to them before. And my read of the history of Congress is pretty much over all of our history, majorities have tried to get past what they could pass using whatever tactics they could use, meaning rules committee, not allowing amendments on the floor because things will unravel, et cetera. And I think it's more the nature of the Democratic or the Republican coalition, whatever it is, whichever one's in power, that forces them to do that. Thank you, gentlemen. You know, I said at the outset that I'm not an expert. I'm not a scholar. And I don't bring a perspective, a realist 
uh, perspective uh, to the analysis of, of any of this. It's not my work. Um, when I looked at the title of this panel and it said vitality, I immediately thought of the human beings that I met across these three states. Um, I bring the idealism, like many of you, of a citizen, an ordinary citizen who um, wants this country to be America again and, and hopes that the, our new leader will in fact get us there. And, um, and, and my concern um, still is whether um, the incredible involvement at the grassroots level of so many people in both parties, um, which has gotten people up off their couches and out from behind their televisions and really to have conversations about what matters, whether that tremendous involvement has yet resulted in a further polarization and a creation of a bigger uh, space of difference between us and whether in the end we will in fact um, feel that our democracy is, um, has been vitalized or has uh, been somehow harmed by, um, by this polarization. Um, I'm going to now let you guys ask questions of the experts. There are volunteers who are going to come through uh, the aisles with microphones. I see someone over here raising his hand and someone here and someone there. All right, so it is your job to come to the attention of the person in purple or blue. And uh, we will uh, go from mic to mic. I'll call on you and you can address your question to one or both. And who's got the first mic? There we go. Question to the, to the panel. Uh, mentioned polarization and, and potentially just at the elite, but polarization. Talked about the internet and the impact of the new voice. Uh, third element is the great uh, American middle. So the question is, do we have a cocktail for, the, for a new major party? Who wants to take that? Do we have a cocktail for Unless you party? get a change in the electoral system, uh, you know, I just don't see it. There's a monopoly. Uh, that is bred not only by tradition and by the inbuilt advantages of funding and so on, but you know, in a system where we have a single member district a plurality system, it's, it's very hard for a third party to break through. And you might see an independent like Bloomberg or you know, if Schwarzenegger had run as an independent, he probably would have won as an independent. You know, per strong personalities like that. But um, I think that's going to be an unusual occurrence. And I actually, this relates to something else I wanted to say. I, I think Obama is going to be, despite the horrific challenges he's going to face uh, in domestic and foreign policy, again, if he is elected president, um, I think he's going to be a very successful president and potentially a great president because of his leadership abilities and his instincts to do more than just try and you know, win with 51%. And I think that's going to, and I think he does have some political reform instincts. And if I'm right about that, I think that will take a lot of the steam out of you know, trying to form a third party. One last thing, if you look at policies, one thing where I think we've seen a signal of where he's going to go in a policy sense is in recent weeks, he has increasingly listed uh, the transformation of our energy system in the United States uh, toward sustainable energy and the inv public investment that could push that forward as his highest priority. Uh, I think that that is somehow going to intersect with the economic crisis to be the venue for public investment that will help to revive the American economy. And to the extent that green might have been one of the alternative third parties. I think he's going to take the steam away from that. David. Uh, we, we, we disagree a lot. I, I, uh, I don't believe for a minute that the government of the United States is uh, the appropriate person to bet on uh, through uh, other kinds of technology, which will be the technological winners. The last time I remember that happening, we did the uh, corn and uh, everybody in Iowa and Illinois liked it because they could grow a lot of corn and that was going to be, it was going to save the country. We were going to have corn in our gasoline and blah, blah, blah. And, and it turns out that not only is it expensive, it's not even good for the environment. So one of the reasons we disagree and we all can't get along it's is because we, we disagree about whether the government can do that. I don't think the government can do that. I'd rather have venture capitalists here investing their money in it. And so 
there's no way Larry or Senator Obama or Jesus could convince me that that's what we ought to do. So we just disagree. So my view is politics either works or it doesn't work, and the Republicans blew it. Okay, they just blew it over the last eight years. So it's the Democrats' turn. But without a speech for Senator Obama, I would say if I were Senator Obama and I wanted X energy, I'd take 51 votes. I wouldn't try and get somebody, wouldn't try and get me to come over on their side. I'm not coming over. I think it's wrong. 51 votes, you win. And then the policy either works or it doesn't work. Back to the last point on the question I would ask is, I would think, you know, the trouble with is that probably the best chance for a third party is uh, a group who's fiscally conservative, people who are fiscally conservative and socially liberal, who think that the Republicans are too uh, hard on uh, gay marriage and all those things, and immigration, and, and the Democratic Party is too spendthrift. So a party in the center would be that. And so that's the party I think has the best chance. Larry's right, the features of the system don't work that way, but, but there are, uh, Senator Obama's got a shot to change that. I agree with him on that. Now, whether he does or not, uh, whether, whether that's where he comes out, uh, he could do it, and it would take the steam away. Larry's right if it works the way he says it does. But if not, uh, I think that, that movement will perk up and more people will, will think about it. I personally would join such a party in about six seconds. It's out there, Dave. It's called the Libertarian Party. I have voted Libertarian. <laughs> But with Bob Barr, uh, I'm not sure. I know no, that Larry has a quick I, I just My question is this. Uh, you know, if we're going to really make uh, wind, solar, and other decentralized forms of renewable energy feasible as a, as a substantial solution to the bind we're in, we need a truly national electricity grid. Who's going to build it? I agree with uh, that. A, a, you know, some uh, state or regional level uh, electricity company or some state government. I mean, there are huge sections of this problem that can, and, and uh, high speed trains and so on that can only happen with government and government at the federal yeah. level. All right, we're going to the second question. Yeah. Uh, do you have any concern about the Bradley effect? And if not, why not? Okay, does that. The first person to answer, well, please Bradley, explain. The explain Bradley it. effect, there's a study uh, recently attributed to uh, Paul Snyderman at Stanford that shows the Bradley effects at 6%. Paul does not agree with that, that that's the, that the effect explain of 6 to everyone. Uh, the Bra oh, so, well, these people, I mean, undergrads, I'd have to say the Bradley effect. The Bradley effect is a uh, former mayor of Los Angeles. Uh, Tom Bradley was a uh, very popular running for governor against Duke Magian, and all the polls showed him uh, winning, 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 and he lost. And then in the reanalysis of the polls, it turns out that people would not say they wouldn't vote for an African-American candidate for president. That's the Bradley effect. So the, the actual uh, study, I, th I think there's a, there is about a 3% effect. Uh, that is uh, the Bradley effect. And, and so 3% of the people who will not vote for Senator Obama because of his race uh, will not say that in a survey. It uh, could be, I don't think it's 6%, but it's certainly lower than it was uh, uh, 25 years ago uh, on the Bradley effect. We've done a number of experiments, but there's no way we can duplicate uh, uh, walking in. So what, let me just say what the experiment is. You, you have internet surveys. You divide the samples randomly. You have candidates. Uh, so, in one, so she's a candidate. She has exactly the same views. The first half of the sample views her as an African American. The second half of the sample views her as white. Then you ask a whole series of questions. You keep them in, you, you, you uh, involve them and get them to know the candidates better over a period of six months or so. And we get, you can get about two and a half, three percent effect on that. Um, my name is Frank Vigil, class of 83 and 84, and I've appreciated the discourse going back and forth. The, the one part that really uh, astounded me, and I raised my hand in the midst of it, even though nobody was looking since I was in the back, was uh, when uh, Larry made uh, what I thought a very diplomatic point about um, incendiary uh, commentary uh, prompted by, I guess it's more coming from Palin, but McCain's been doing the same in terms of prompting calls of I think you took a nice one, which was terrorist, but what I've read in, in, the, in the news lately, it, it included commentary that goes by kill him. And Professor Brady, uh, I, you know, I was just stunned by your answer of relativism. It's like, 
You know, there's other negativism. It's been worse. They've called candidate spouses prostitutes. And, uh, you know, I, I'm really appalled by that answer because this isn't just calling um, a spouse a, a prostitute, which is unsavory. This is in a post-9-11 environment where uh, terrorism means something very broad and it impacts freedoms and liberties in, in many, many ways. You know, I'm not I would have expected you to just I'm say, no, familiar. that's wrong. Something. I'm not familiar with the incident, so... So I'm going to explain the incident. To what's, what's exactly the incident we're talking about? There's an allegation. I'm actually trying. An allegation, OK. Uh, I, I'm, I'm trying to confirm whether, uh, you know, uh, it, 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 I'm trying to determine the extent to which there is factual consensus that the person in the crowd yelled, kill him. Mm -hmm. um, there seems to be some dispute over that. This was at a Sarah Palin rally. Okay. But I do know that people in McCain and Palin rallies have yelled t terrorist uh, in terms of what Obama is. And I do know they've used the word treason, which is a pretty provocative term in terms of what it can incite. And I've seen nothing from either candidate denouncing it. And I do agree with the questioner. I think this is, what this is, is a whole new level. Well, look, I'm not in favor of the comment. Um, I'm not voting for them, so I, I, but the point is, what are, what are they to denounce? That someone alleged to have said terrorist or treason? Right. So how does, how does that, I mean, if they, did, if they did say it, certainly the candidate didn't say it, then, the, then you've accepted the allegation that my speech is what led to this. I, I just, I'm sorry, I don't get it. I, I guess I'm my, not in favor of what you said, what I but think first of all, say, it's an allegation. This is, the other two are not allegations, they're facts. What you say, if you have the kind of integrity that I thought Senator McCain had, uh, is, I'm sorry, my friend, uh, this is beyond the pale. There are certain things that are unacceptable in American <clears throat> politics. I disagree with Senator Obama. I disagree <clears throat> with his policies. I think he would be bad for our country in a lot of what he would do, but he's not a terrorist and his remarks are not treasonous, and to say that is a, a dangerous thing and unacceptable in American politics. It's okay. Yes, thank you. The, what I'm doing is I'm pointing at the person with the microphone, who's the, the, the volunteer with the microphone, so if you want to speak, you need to get the attention of the person with the microphone. Yes, it's on you, ma'am. Uh, yes, uh, I'm on the same subject. I guess it's called the Bradley effect, but what I read was it's as much as 10 I'm sorry? I've read that it's as much as 10% of people that are polled will not tell you that they won't vote for a black man, and that's pretty high. Uh, I hope that the predictions of both of you that Obama wins is correct. I just fingers crossed for that, but if it's as high as 10%, okay. and that's also uh, I heard the words kill him also. It's been broadcast several times, although I listened to MSNBC, and I heard the terrorist one. I did not hear the treason one. But that kill him is, it's been repeated a number of times. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Let's go to the next question over here. Yeah, I was wondering to what you'd attribute the current climate of anti-intellectualism. Almost, almost, uh, oh, sure. Um, I was wondering to what you would attribute the current climate of anti-intellectualism, most strident anti-intellectualism in American politics. Did you get the question? Yeah. American politics has always been anti-intellectual. In 1831, when Alexis de Tocqueville came to the United States after spending time with our most intellectual politicians, Daniel Webster, John Calhoun, and others, he wrote the chapter of how America would perish on the shoals of uh, democracy because our best and brightest uh, never went into politics. Uh, and, and, I, and I'm not quite sure, because when I look at the campaigns, there are a lot of uh, exceedingly good economists, uh, political scientists, and sociologists, such as Professor Diamond, that are involved in the campaigns. Uh, so. so it has been that way, but should it be that way? Well, obviously not. But I, I just want to say one other thing uh, in response to that. I, I do agree with Dave. I think that separate and apart from race, um, there was you know, an undercurrent of uh, when they were saying that Barack Obama was an elitist, they were saying, he's an intellectual. You know, do you really want someone like, he was a Harvard professor and, you know, he's not like us, he thinks very abstractly and so on, he doesn't connect with us on an emotional level. 
you know, after what's happened in the last three weeks, I think suddenly the American people are not recoiling so much at the thought of having a former professor and someone with a very powerful intellect as president of the United States to try to come to grips with this problem. I wanted to know um, if you think there might be an October surprise coming, and if so, what is it? Well, Larry, this has turned into kind of a political rally, so you should handle that. Uh, <laughs> I have no idea. Um, you know, uh, I, I, there could be a terrorist attack on the United States. I don't think that anyone would want it, uh, obviously, or um, do anything to let it happen. Um, but, you know, uh, I don't think it's likely to happen. And I, I do think you have to acknowledge that um, there hasn't been one since September 11th. And there's been some things uh, that have been done that have increased our, um, our, um, our resilience in that regard. Other than that, uh, you know, the reason why it would be called a surprise is that no one would have anticipated it. <laughs> And I think the fall surprise happened when the, you know, when the stock market crashed. I think that's really what historians will write about. David, do you want to? Mm -hmm. OK, right here. Uh, Professor Brady, a question. You uh, indicated that in 1974, or thereabouts, was the decline of the, uh, uh, or the increase in the partisanship. What happened in 1974, and do you think that there's ever any change, that, any chance that we could get back to a nonpartisan situation? Well, the, there, are, there are a number of candidates. By partisanship, you mean the level at which Democrats and Republicans in Congress uh, disagreed with each other. Uh, first, uh, I want to say the days of bipartisanship weren't so hunky-dory. The bipartisanship essentially occurred during the period of the Eisenhower uh, period. It was a period in which race as an issue was off the table, so you had segregation. And one of the reasons you could be so chummy and bipartisan was because race was off the table. So Southern Democrats and Northern, Repo Southern Democrats, and Northern Democrats could get along. Uh, women were not fully involved in the political process. So there's a lot of uh, stuff that went with non, uh, uh, not, or more bipartisanship. Uh, the partisanship, the main probably reasons are, first of all, they changed the rules in the House of Representatives, making it harder to vote in a cross-partisan fashion. And secondly, uh, by 1974, the issues dividing the country on economics and tax issues had begun to drive uh, uh, voters out. And finally, there was a sorting, which meant that Southern Democrats uh, who had been conservative Southern Democrats began to lose their seats and retire. They were replaced by Republicans and liberal Republicans like Scranton and Rockefeller as they began to retire from their House seats or be defeated. The party sorted out. So prior to 74, there were liberal Republicans, conservative Democrats. Beginning that period, you get this sorting out where afterward there are, most Republicans are conservative, most Democrats are liberal. And, uh, and so that's the main, those are the main causes uh, of what drove it. And uh, the question of whether that's going to change uh, really, uh, really depends upon, uh, you know, you know I, I just really don't believe a lot of these issues are 80, 20 issues. Maybe building an infrastructure for electricity, yeah. Putting money, investing, U.S. investing money in alternative fuels like we knew which we were doing, we're not going to agree on that. So there are some issues where we can agree, some where we can't. And I, I just think there are a lot of issues where there's enough uncertainty that I believe in markets, he believes in government. And I don't see how we resolve those issues, except you elect a president, they get some policies, they win a majority, they work or they don't work. If they work, then you've got a realignment and an important historical election. If they don't work, the other side comes back in, which means which is a great thing, because that's what democracy is all about. So, Can I, just a couple of things. First of all, I believe in markets tempered and regulated a little bit more by government than we've seen in the last few years and, and couple of decades, and with a somewhat larger role for government action when necessary. But anyway, uh, really more of a question to you, Dave. 
I wonder if um, another piece of this hasn't been the increasingly, and maybe it hasn't been increasing, it only seems like that, scientific precision, technical vigor, and political shamelessness of congressional redistricting. Oh, it's, they've uh, and, gotten, they're so good at now that. And you know, I, I, one of the things I would really like to see um, is you know, to take uh, the, uh, the blatant partisan politics out of it as much as possible by giving it to nonpartisan commissions everywhere. I, I, agree. I think if you had more, you know, less hard partisan districts, you'd get more moderate members of Congress. The state of Iowa uh, tried that, uh, and I think there's not so many congressmen and congresswomen in Iowa, so it's hard to get the experimental effect, but they, the districts in Iowa are drawn by a nonpartisan commission, they're fair. It, it made elections much more competitive, and the early results led us to believe that candidates talk about policy issues more and they have to camp, campaign more on it. So uh, I, agree with, I agree with Larry on that. We should have different ways to uh, nominate candidates. If I had to change one thing about American politics, I'd change the way we nominated presidents and the way we nominated uh, congressmen and congresswomen, because what happens is the left in the Democratic Party, the right in the Republican Party, are overemphasized in the primaries, and therefore you get candidates who are pulled both ways. This is something I've never heard him say before. I'm kind of interested uh, in it. How would you change the presidential nomination process? I would change, uh, we're, we're moving toward it uh, anyway, but I would change it to at least one big national primary or four regional primaries placed very close together. Uh, so that uh, so, so that you you don't get this. I, I go to Colorado and I'm an environmentalist, and then I go to Detroit and suddenly I'm uh, anti-environmental and pro-union. And and uh, you know you watch them as the candidates change. They're wearing load and green in Colorado, hard hats and uh, so on. Uh, tubs, uh, hot tubs in Marin County, and uh, so. Uh, We'd save a lot of money too. Yeah. So my yeah. view is uh, uh, for for uh, uh, four regional primaries. Close together, very close together. I, I have, a, excuse me, sorry. I have a question about, um, you know, I'm from Hawaii. I, I went to, um, I was at the school that um, Punahou, where um, Barak went, um, attended in high school. And I, I'm really curious because there's such a stridence in the conversation, not today, by the way, you're refreshing both of you. I really appreciated uh, your candor and the, um, the, the honesty of, of your, ideological views, et cetera. But, but fr from my point of view as, as a Hapa kid, in other words, there's always the issue here in the, in, on the continent about black and white. And I think the really keen um, uh, and important issue is this notion of, of moderating or translating. And as, as a moderator, oftentimes that position isn't given enough uh, credence when in fact on a scale of left to right, black or white, the, med the median, the middle, is really critical. And I think for most of um, this crowd, too, it's an important thing not to think in terms of black or white. How's about competent, able, capable, you know, um, reasoned, all of the other things that, that factor more importantly into global issues? Because in the world, in India, for example, um, the issues aren't black and white. They have 375, um, you know, uh, tribal affiliations, not tribal, but racial affiliations, et cetera. That's what we need in this country. I'm so over the black and white issue only because I'm Hawaiian Chinese and German and English. Where, where's the conversation for a lot of us today? Um, Barak at home is considered hapa. You know, he's half white, half black. So I think that issue really needs to be brought to the fore and accepted. And, and the same thing uh, applies also in politics, I think, in terms of this extreme right, extreme left. I think it's been very unhealthy and uncritical. Perhaps you could speak to that notion of health in psyche and politic. Thank you. Well, I don't think, uh, I think the history of uh, blacks in the United States has uh, not been a pleasant history. Uh, and it's a national shame, and it's taken us a very long time to first end uh, slavery and then to end segregation. Not a pleasant chapter in our history, and uh, Senator Obama is almost perfectly placed, in a sense, to be the person to bring about more healing on, on, that, uh, on that particular issue. But the uh, history of African Americans in the United States is, is unique 
all of our histories are unique, but it's, it's sort of been uniquely bad, and therefore uh, it, it plays a special role in that way. And I agree with you that Senator Obama, uh, by virtue of his background, his competence, uh, his charisma, he's uh, sort of the ideal candidate to deal with that. Yeah, I mean, I, I was just struck uh, more than once, but particularly in a recent interview um, when Barack Obama referred to himself as the child of, you know, uh, black and white parents. He's very conscious of him being of his being a kind of multiracial person and not just an African American. And I, I just think his instincts are he may have to win on a number of issues with 51% or a very narrow margin in the House. But I think his, he's got some interesting instincts to try and build bridges and transcend divides. And it's one of the things that I think is going to be fascinating to watch and that makes me the most hopeful about him and what he may do to our politics. I, what I, I remember most about the Jacksonian area is the only area in which there was a governmental surplus, which they returned to the states. <laughs> uh, that ain't going to happen yeah. in the first four years. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm with you on that. Uh, well, I don't know. It's you know, it's it's possible, uh, obviously. But uh, my view is po politics is politics is pr pretty much politics. You, there are there are differences over the way we ought to approach health care. There are differences over these big issues, and uh, and pretty much in order to get it through, you got to win 218 votes in the House, and you got to be able to beat the filibuster pivot most of the time in the Senate. And when you and if and, and and what happens is you can't, you can't cover all that. So you make compromises. So you don't have 100% universal health care coverage. You got, you improve it from 47 million who aren't insured to 20 million who aren't insured. And I, so that that's the way politics normally works. And my expectation is that over the next four to eight years it will continue to work that way. Which doesn't mean that Obama won't be a great president, et cetera, et cetera. It's just by the criteria I judge it, uh, per, uh, progress on these issues is, is enough. You, don't, you, you, can't, you, can't, you can't have perfection. I would just add a couple of things. Uh, revolutionary is not a word I would use, but I think his presidency, if he becomes president, could be transformative in uh, several respects. Uh, and two that I'd mentioned that I think may be relevant to your question are, first of all, I think he will, he will be an inspirational president. Uh, and I think he will remove, by the power of his vision and idealism, by in part his charisma and rhetoric, and by his desire to accommodate and reach out and transcend divisions a bit, uh, he'll remove some of the toxicity from our politics. And inspire young people to remain involved. I think his instinct, the money won't be there in the near term, but his instinct will want to be to find ways to expand national service programs, expand Teach for America, uh, and, and other forms of service that could tap into the idealism of young people. And the other thing is, I, I really do think he is going to very rapidly alter the way people in other countries look at the United States. Uh, this is going to be a huge impact. Just close your eyes and think about the way the world is going to look at the United States on January 21st if he becomes the president of the United States. It's not going to you know, make heaven descend on earth in terms of all of our difficult relationships, but it is going to you know, give some space for the next administration to rebuild alliances and recover some of the geopolitical soft power that we've lost. I agree with that so much. I'm going to visit France after January 20th. Uh, <laughs> uh, one, of the, uh, one, of the, one of the questions that uh, Ju Julie had that came up earlier is one way in which there will be a change is the, just give you a couple, the, uh, some numbers. In uh, 2004, uh, the state of Iowa, there were 6,000 more Republic, registered Republicans than Democrats, uh, and a state George Bush uh, narrowly carried. In uh, 2008, there are now 100,000 more registered uh, Democrats than Republicans. Uh, about 45,000 of them are Republicans uh, who've switched to Democrat, 
and uh, the majority are young people under 30 who have registered. I expect that turnout to be exceedingly high. Uh, I hope that the expectations, so, but this happened in 1992. When Bill Clinton won uh, a public policy class I taught here, which usually had about 150 kids, had 375. And what happened was uh, th they were turned off over time. Uh, and, and so I hope the expectations, uh, I hope that the, the expectations are managed in such a fashion that these people who have become involved uh, don't look for perfection in the next year, uh, that, but look for uh, progress and that they stay involved in politics. And if that happens, that is a pretty dramatic uh, change and increase in uh, democratic participation. To you, sir. Yes, uh, there's a parallel session going on on global climate change right now. And I've heard you talk of, of energy independence and I've heard it talk of free markets. The question is, how is American democracy going to face this incredible problem? I think it'll be the same way we have faced other problems. Uh, it will require executive and congressional action. Uh, what I would add to that is, uh, you know, I think on the big challenges we face, where there's so much momentum behind the existing policy, uh, you know, this isn't going to happen out of some congressional initiative by a pair of senators and a pair of congressmen. What has to happen to change the way we power our economy and power our lives to slow down, hopefully, global warming enough to avert what look like otherwise to be truly catastrophic consequences is so big and so diffuse and touches so many aspects of American lives that it's going to require, I won't just say presidential leadership, but extraordinary presidential leadership. Because in my opinion, given everything I read, we don't have a lot of time. Uh, and so it's not just mobile, you know, crafting a policy that has a better chance of, of getting a handle on this and mobilizing a congressional majority. It's persuading people. Uh, you know, building support and understanding among the public. And I, you know, one of the things about Barack Obama that could generate some hope here is that he does seem to have very significant persuasive abilities. Uh, I think that the issue of global warming is not an American issue particularly. So that the fact that Senator Obama when he comes in will be able to build these alliances. I think the, if the United States were to reduce its use of energy by 30% in the next five years, uh, the calculation I've seen is it would affect uh, global, uh, the global climate by 0. 0.0007. And that's because as China and India grow. So the pres next president of the United States has to figure out a way to get China and India to buy in to uh, beginning to develop a system that uh, cuts, cuts these back. It's possible to do, and the way you have to buy it in is we're going to have to pay, in some senses, uh, pay them to get in the game and then establish the set of rules. The same way the WTO, World Trade Organization, et cetera, works. Uh, that, to me, is the biggest problem. Uh, how does the President of the United States get a buy-in from the developing world, uh, and, and that, that's a key issue. And I think, uh, as Larry pointed out, that on foreign affairs, the president has a much uh, bigger hand, a better hand to play. And uh, that's an important place where he can change. And uh, Congress, uh, with all of its little uh, region by region, difference by difference, uh, vested interests, uh, has less of a role to play. So there's more room for the president to move there. We have time for one more question, and I believe it's going to be right over here. I just have one question. Um, as a, moderate, a former moderate Republican who feels that she's been forced out of her party, where do you see, if we don't start a third party, um, those of us who are fiscally conservative but socially liberal going in the future? Without the creation of a third party of uh, fiscally conservative and socially liberal, where do you see those folks going? If I, if I knew that, I'd be a lot more important than I am. Uh, uh, 
well, I think what's going to happen is the Republican Party is going to suffer a, a big loss. And then, uh, and then the think tanks and uh, the various public intellectuals are going to have to argue about uh, and, and redefine what conservatism means. Uh, what, what does it mean? How does it work out? And, uh, and then it's the, their job when they've done that to reach out to, to people that hold your views and say, this is, the, this is where we go. And this, so there's going to be a lot of soul searching in the Republican Party and among conservatives. And a big hunk of it is going to be concerned with precisely the moderate uh, voter that you, that, that you represent, that sort of all of California represents, right? So uh, the California Republican Party, which is very uh, pro-choice and uh, fiscal. So it, it, that's the point. That, that, that's what will happen, I think. They'll have to. They'll have to seriously rethink what it means, and they'll have to reach out to you because they can't win without having voters like yourself. And, and one thing about political parties is they want to win. But the problem is they also, I think, think they can't win without social conservatives, which is why McCain chose Sarah Palin as, as his running mate. And I think that there's this deep fissure in the Republican mm -hmm. Party. And uh, I think the, the, that the Republican Party is going to have a tough time in the, in the coming years and in the next presidential election figuring out how to resolve that. I mean, the likelihood is you're, people like you are going to wind up being swing voters for some time. I would have said before this fiscal crisis that, again, I think Obama had some of the moderate instincts. I know that it hasn't appeared in his voting record in the Senate, but nevertheless, I think he does, that might have drawn some people like you into um, more of an orientation toward the Democratic Party, or at least support for him and what he was trying to do. But I think in the midst of this fiscal crisis, we're going to wind up returning to um, you know, deficit spending uh, to get us out of it. And I do worry about the uh, implications for the deficit. And I think it's going to leave a lot of fiscal conservatives very, very troubled. David. Uh, what I want to emphasize is how little we actually know. How little we know. The last time I heard that the Republican Party was done, and I just counted this up uh, last week, it was 1964. Wither the Republican Party. It's dead, gone, disappeared, they're done. And in 1966, the biggest single recovery in a year in both the House and the Senate, and then 68, 72, and then a long string, basically, of Republican presidents broken by Jimmy Carter as a one-termer three times in a row under Reagan and Bush. So I think uh, how we, we, we simply don't know what's going to happen. Uh, my view, personal view, is I wish every American president success because I'm an American, uh, I, I, and I may have some ideological doubts about whether that's the right way to go, but I wish him the best, and I hope it works. But you just don't know what's going to happen. It's just not at all clear to me that uh, it, I can imagine 100 worlds in which Barack Obama uh, doesn't get elected through no fall of his own in 2012. And then I can imagine a world in which what Larry just said happens and it, and it works, and uh, and, and, I, and that that'd be fine with me. Uh, so, but the bottom line is, I, I don't think we know. We have a hard enough time. I'm pretty good at predicting the past. Uh, uh, I, I know, uh, and I have a hard time explaining it. So, I'm I'm not going to be too good at the future. Final final thoughts. Uh, my final thought is I certainly embody exactly what uh, my dear friend and colleague Dave Brady said, or I would have uh, adjusted my uh, 401k plan yeah. <laughs> about five <laughs> weeks ago. Um, so I agree with what you yeah. said, uh, and I think uh, you know the future is um, uh, even the future of this election is is not entirely certain. And you know I, as frankly a Democrat and Obama supporter. Do worry that people could, you know, just think that it's over. It's, it's really, it's not completely over. But the other thing I'd say is, uh, the, when you consider what has happened in the last few weeks and how long it may take us to climb out of it, and how global this is, and how much the world appears in a kind of panicky freefall, the next president of the United States may face the most difficult inaugural period of a presidency since 1932. 
And how can we possibly know how that's going to come out? Yep, I agree. Anything uh, nope, further? Nope, All right. I, I... Please join me in thanking professors Dave Brady and Larry Diamond. The preceding program is copyrighted by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu.